This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 9, for broadcast on the 30th of January, 2019. Coming up on Space Time, some of Earth's oldest rocks found on the Moon. Scientists finally know what time it is on Saturn. And a new hypothesis which kills off Planet Nine. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Well, it looks like some of the oldest rock samples on Earth have just been discovered, not here on Earth, but amongst lunar rock samples brought back to Earth from the Moon. The findings, reported in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters, suggest that a 1.8 gram rock sample collected by the Apollo 14 crew during their 1971 mission to the lunar surface may have originally been thrown there as ejector from an ancient asteroid impact on Earth 4 billion years ago. The sample contains traces of minerals with a chemical composition common to early Earth, but very unusual on the Moon. The sample was on loan from NASA to Curtin University, where it was investigated in cooperation with researchers from the Swedish Museum of Natural History, the Australian National University and the Lunar and Planetary Institute of Houston. The study's lead author, Professor Alexander Nemchin from Curtin School of Earth and Planetary Sciences, says the sample shows mineralogy similar to that of granite, which is extremely rare on the Moon, but common on Earth. He says the sample also contains quartz, feldspar and zircon, which is even more unusual to find on the lunar surface. By determining the age of zircon crystals found in the sample, Nemchin and colleagues were able to pinpoint the age of the host rock to about 4 billion years making it similar to some of the oldest rocks ever found on Earth. The authors say the chemistry of the zircon in this sample is also very different from any other zircon grains ever analysed in lunar samples and remarkably similar to zircons found on Earth. The chemistry of this lunar zircon sample also indicates that it formed in low temperature and probably in the presence of water and in oxidised conditions, making it very characteristic of Earth and highly uncharacteristic of the Moon. Now, it might just be possible that some of these unusual conditions could have occurred very briefly in some local pockets on the Moon, and the sample is the result of this brief deviation from normality. However, Occam's razor tells us the simplest solution is often the best, and the simple explanation is that this is a piece that was formed on Earth and then brought to the surface of the Moon, most likely as a meteorite generated by an asteroid hitting the Earth around 4 billion years ago and throwing material up into space, some of which eventually floated to the Moon. Mind you, 4 billion years ago, the Moon was also a lot closer to the Earth than what it is today, making the journey easier. A chemical analysis suggests this rock crystallised about 20 kilometres beneath the Earth's surface during the Hadean Epoch between 4 and 4.1 billion years ago. It was then excavated by one or more large impact events and launched into cislunar space. That's the region around the Earth encompassing the Moon's orbit around the Earth. Previous work by the team had already shown that impacting asteroids at that time were producing craters thousands of kilometres wide on Earth, sufficiently large to bring material from those depths up to the surface. Once the sample reached the lunar surface, it was affected by several other impact events, one of which partially melted it about 3.9 billion years ago, and which probably also buried it beneath the lunar surface. This sample, therefore, is a relic of an intense period of asteroid impacts known as the Late Heavy Bombardment, which shaped the solar system during its first billion years of existence. After this period, the Moon was affected by smaller, less frequent impact events. The final impact event to affect this sample probably occurred about 26 million years ago, when an impacting asteroid hit the Moon, producing a small 340-metre diameter cone crater and excavating the sample back to the lunar surface, where astronauts then collected it almost exactly 48 years ago during NASA's Apollo 14 mission. Nimchin says this discovery helps paint a better picture of the early Earth and of the late heavy bombardment, which modified our planet during the dawn of life. We believe that we, we found something that potentially can be rock from Earth in one of the lunar samples brought back by Apollo 14 astronauts. They actually found the sample and picked it up and then we're just working on the back of their success. It pretty much started a couple of years ago when one of our colleagues in the US raised the question of of how and whether we can find the pieces of of Earth's material on the Moon in the lunar collections. And we just realized that we may already have this, this sample. So we did some additional analysis and then come up with this possibility not 100% bulletproof, but uh, it's closest to uh, 
terrestrial stuff that, that we probably have at the moment. So what is it about this rock that makes you think it originated on Earth rather than the Moon? Normally we differentiate samples between different planets based on the some differences in, in chemistry, for example, and, and we can say that certain meteorites are coming from Moon, uh, we can say that certain meteorites are coming from Mars. So there are these differences that pretty much let us determine where a sample originates. So Earth is, is different from some of these other planetary bodies, so we should be able, in theory, pick Earth material on any other planet if there is some. So in this particular case, chemistry of the sample suggests that conditions of formation kind of very similar to what we expect from Earth, and then and they have really very unusual for the moon. It's, it's still probably possible to, to form the sample on the moon, but it's going to be a very unusual set of conditions for the moon. So this is granite you found there. The thing had quartz and feldspar in it. The zircons are also a little bit different from the zircons you found on the moon previously. And of course, the way the whole thing was put together with water and oxidized atmosphere. Yes, that, that's, that's exactly what, what, what we're talking about. Conditions, presence of water, oxidation, that, that is, is, is very common on, on Earth, but Moon is, is very different in that respect. So it's very hard to form these conditions on the Moon, as far as we know. And then you looked at the zircons, and you use those to date the sample. How does one use zircons to date a rock? Well, zir zircon is, is very common mineral that is used for geochronology. Where when we are uh, studying terrestrial rocks, the best age we can extract is coming from zircon. So it, it's a very useful tool. So we, at, at some point many years ago, when the first samples came from the Moon, people realized that there are some zircons on the moon as well and then start using them to get the ages of different rocks. See, it's pretty much based on, on the fact that zircon accumulates a little bit of uranium and uranium is radioactive and decays into lead and then you can measure quantity of lead and uranium in the zircon and knowing the rate of decay you can determine age. And zircons don't change once they've crystallized. They're like a little stasis field. Yes, they are very hard to, to modify. There are some processes that can, of course can change mm. zircon, but it's very robust. It can survive very high temperatures and it's mechanically very stable, so that's the reason it's one of the best tools to get the age. So as the uranium decays into lead, you look at the ratio, and because you know how long it takes uranium to convert yeah. to lead, you can work out how, how long ago that particular zircon crystal formed. Yes, that's, that's correct. How would an earth rock get to the moon? I mean, this is after the moon formed, of course. Yes, of, co of, of, of course. Well, you, you, you probably need quite a substantial impact of the surface. Uh, that's how material is transferred between different planetary modes. So you hit, say, if, if we hit Earth with a large asteroid, some of this material can reach velocities that allow it to escape Earth's gravitation, and then so they launch it to space, and then, then some would finish on, uh, on other planetary bodies. So we expect something like that happened in order to transfer some of this stuff from Earth to Moon. The zircons gave you a date for this rock of around 4 billion to 4.1 billion years ago. At that time, yeah. the Earth and Moon were a lot closer than they are now. Uh, yeah, some est people estimate that it's probably a third of the current distance at the time of this particular event, at mm. 4 billion years. Other than proving the fact that Earth and Moon swap rocks... Well, first of all, I guess we can look at this sample even further and then try to really understand Earth, if it is really coming from the Earth. And then the good thing about it is it's quite old. And then we don't have a lot of rocks on Earth of that age that survived because Earth is very active and then so it constantly destroys whatever it's produced. So going back is very hard in geology. Well, there is a single rock on Earth of that age, which is a castanite in Canada, nothing older. Now, if we start to search for terrestrial rocks on the moon, in a way, there is a feeling that we potentially can have a better chance of finding old terrestrial rocks on the moon than on the Earth itself. So eventually we may have a little collection of, of the samples and that would give us a chance to see and understand early history of the Earth. So by going to the moon we can find out more about the Earth itself? Yes, potentially, because, well, there are some estimates uh, of amount of, of material, or terrestrial material that potentially can be sitting near the surface, on the surface of the moon, uh, and, and estimates are sometimes, say, about several hundred kilograms per square kilometer of terrestrial rocks that should be sitting somewhere at the surface on the moon. So, well, okay, it doesn't necessarily a lot, 
but it's also not really, we, we're not hunting for few isolated pieces over the whole surface of the planetary body. So there, there is a big chance that if we specifically concentrate on the task, we may be able to find some of that. Because this 4.1 billion year age is pretty important. It was the time of the late heavy bombardment when things were pretty violent in the solar system generally, possibly because Jupiter and Saturn were on their planetary migration back out from the inner solar system, so they were flinging stuff towards the inner planets. And also so it was around this time that life got started on Earth. Well, yes, we, we're still kind of touching the surface here in all these concepts uh, about life, about bombardment history in the solar system. They could be, in fact, related to some degree in both ways. The people saying that life could be brought to Earth by some of these meteorites or, of course, heavy bombardment can result in wiping pieces of life that forming at the same time out. So, yes, any really new piece of information, every single piece of rock we find quite often makes a huge difference in our understanding because they are so rare, it is important to, to have more of, of, of these finds. Another piece in the puzzle. Yes, it's how it all works. We, we kind of put one piece after another and then gradually start to understand this whole thing a little bit better. The ultimate aim is to try to develop understanding to the level where we can model these things. Everybody seems to be getting carried away about this find of Earth rock on the moon. Uh, we need to be careful, so it, we still need to work more uh, in order to kind of prove this idea 100%. What, what we try to do, why we publish this paper, is to start people thinking about the possibilities, so we all concentrate a little bit on that. We wouldn't even think about that without whatever this question asked by one of our colleagues. So it's, sometimes it's a matter of actually thinking about the problem or possibility, and then you start finding new things. So this is one of the reasons we try to publish this stuff, is to initiate a little bit of discussion in science community. That's Professor Alexander Nemchin from Curtin University's School of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's Cassini spacecraft has solved yet another mystery about the ringed ward of Saturn. It's allowed scientists to work out how long a Saturnian day is. The new findings tell astronomers a day on Saturn lasts approximately 10 hours, 33 minutes and 38 seconds. Now that's a figure which has eluded planetary scientists for decades. That's because being a gas giant, there is no solid surface with landmarks to track as the planet rotates. A problem made worse by its unusual magnetic field, which hides the planet's rotation rate. Now a report in the Astrophysical Journal says the answer turned out to be hidden in the rings. During Cassini's orbits of Saturn, instruments aboard the spacecraft examined the icy rocky rings in unprecedented detail. The study's lead author, Christopher Mankovich, from the University of California, Santa Cruz, used the data to study wave patterns within the rings. His work determined that the rings responded to vibrations from within the planet itself, acting in the same sort of way as seismometers do to measure movement caused by earthquakes. You see, the interior of Saturn vibrates at frequencies which cause variations in its gravitational field. And the rings, in turn, detect these movements in the field. Mankiewicz says particles throughout the rings can't help but fill these oscillations in the gravity field. At specific locations in the rings, these oscillations catch ring particles at just the right time in their orbits to gradually build up energy. And that energy gets carried away as an observable wave. Mankiewicz's research describes how he developed models of Saturn's internal structure that would match the ring's waves. That allowed him to track movements of the interior of the planet, and thus its rotation. That rotation rate of 10 hours, 33 minutes and 38 seconds, which the analysis yielded, is several minutes faster than previous estimates in 1981. They were based on radio signals from NASA's Voyager spacecraft. The analysis of the Voyager data, which estimated a Saturnian day to be 10 hours, 39 minutes and 23 seconds, was based on magnetic field information. Cassini used magnetic field data too, but earlier estimates ranged from 10 hours, 36, all the way up to 10 hours, 48 minutes. Scientists often rely on magnetic fields to help them measure a planet's rotation rate. Jupiter's magnetic axis, like that of Earth, isn't aligned to its rotational axis, so it swings around as the planet rotates, enabling scientists to measure a periodic signal in radio waves to get the rotation rate. However, Saturn's different. Its unique magnetic field is nearly perfectly aligned with its rotational axis. This is why the ring's finding has been key to honing in on the length of the day. 
Cassini's mission ended in September 2017, when, low on fuel, the spacecraft was deliberately plunged into Saturn's atmosphere to avoid the probe crashing into one of the planet's many moons and possibly contaminating that moon with Earth microbes. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new study suggests the long sought after Planet 9 doesn't exist after all, and that the strange orbits of some of the objects at the furthest reaches of the solar system, thought to be caused by a mysterious ninth planet, could instead be explained by the combined gravitational force of a whole bunch of smaller objects orbiting the Sun out beyond Neptune. This alternative explanation of the so-called Planet 9 hypothesis, which is reported in the Astronomical Journal, proposes a disk made up of small icy bodies with a combined mass as much as 10 times that of Earth. When combined with a simplified model of our solar system, the gravitational forces of this hypothesized disk can account for the unusual orbital architecture exhibited by some objects in the outer reaches of the solar system. While the new theory is not the first to propose the gravitational forces of a massive disk made up of small objects could avoid the need for a ninth planet, it is the first such theory to be able to explain the significant features of the observed orbits while still accounting for the mass and gravity of the other eight planets in the solar system. Beyond the orbit of Neptune lies the Kuiper Belt, made up of millions of small icy bodies left over from the formation of the solar system. Neptune and the other giant planets influence the objects of the Kuiper Belt and beyond, collectively known as trans-Neptunian objects, which encircle the Sun on nearly circular paths from almost all directions. However, astronomers have discovered some mysterious outliers. Since 2003, around 30 trans-Neptunian objects on highly elliptical orbits have been detected. They stand out from other trans-Neptunian objects by sharing, on average, the same spatial orientation. Now, this type of clustering can't be explained by our existing eight-planet solar system architecture. Therefore, it's led to some astronomers hypothesizing that the unusual orbits could be the result of the gravitational influence of a yet-to-be-discovered Planet Nine. The Planet Nine hypothesis suggests that to account for the unusual orbits of these trans-Neptunian objects, there would have to be another planet, a Planet Nine, believed to be about four times the size and ten times the mass of the Earth, lurking somewhere out in the dark distant reaches of the solar system, and shepherding trans-Neptunian objects in the same direction through the combined effect of its gravity and that of the rest of the solar system. One of the study's authors, Antranik Sophilian from Cambridge University, says while the Planet Nine hypothesis is fascinating, if this hypothesized world really does exist, it's so far avoided detection. Sophilian colleagues wanted to see if there could be another less dramatic and perhaps more natural cause for the unusual orbit seen in some trans-Neptunian objects. Rather than allowing for a ninth planet and then worrying about its formation and unusual orbit, why not simply account for the gravity of small objects constituting a disk out beyond Neptune and see what happens? So, the authors model the full spatial dynamics of trans-Neptunian objects with the combined action of the giant outer planets and a massive extended disk out beyond Neptune. The calculations reveal that such a model could explain the perplexing spatially clustered orbits of some trans-Neptunian objects. In the process, the authors were able to identify ranges in the disk's mass, its roundness or eccentricity, and force gradual shifts in its orientation or precession rate, all of which faithfully reproduce the outlier trans-Neptunian object orbits. Sophilian says that if you remove Planet 9 from the model and instead allow lots of small objects scattered across a wide area, then collective attractions between those objects could just as easily account for the eccentric orbits seen in some trans-Neptunian objects. Of course, there is a big problem with all this, and that is that earlier attempts to estimate the total mass of all objects beyond Neptune in the Kuiper Belt and even extending out towards the Oort Cloud, they've only ever added up to around one-tenth the mass of the Earth. And that's simply far too little mass to actually explain what's happening. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Now, while we're visiting the outer edge of the solar system, astronomers are ecstatic over the data coming back from NASA's New Horizons spacecraft following its encounter with the distant Kuiper Belt world of 2014 MU69, Ultima Thule. The New Year's Day flyby has provided the clearest view yet of this remarkable ancient object in the far outer reaches of the solar system. The 30-kilometre wide world comprises two roughly spherical bodies or lobes joined together at one end, looking sort of like a snowman. 
The latest data being drip-fed to eager scientists includes observations obtained with the wide-angle multicolor visible imaging camera component of New Horizons' RALF instrument. This image was taken when New Horizons was just 6,700 kilometers from Ultima Thule, just seven minutes before its closest approach. The oblique lighting in this image has revealed new topographical details along the day-night boundary, a region known as the Terminator. These details include numerous small pits up to about 0.7 kilometers in diameter. There's also a large circular feature about 7 kilometers wide on the smaller of the two lobes, which also appears to be a deep depression. What's not clear yet is whether these pits are impact craters or whether they're features resulting from other processes such as collapse pits or the ancient venting of volatile materials. Both lobes are also showing many intriguing light and dark patterns of unknown origin, which may reveal clues about how the body was assembled during the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. One of the most striking features in these new images is what looks like a bright collar separating the two lobes. New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says this new image is now revealing differences in the geologic characteristics of the two lobes of Ultima Thule, and it's presenting scientists with new mysteries as well. Stern says that over the next month, as more data becomes available, there will be better color and better resolution images. New Horizons is 6.64 billion kilometers from Earth, operating nominally and speeding away from the Sun and Ultima Thule at more than 50,700 kilometers an hour. At that distance, it takes some six hours and nine minutes for a radio signal from the spacecraft to reach Earth, traveling at the speed of light. New Horizons was launched on January the 19th, 2006, from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket. The probe made history on July the 14th, 2015, when it became the first spacecraft to visit Pluto, flying just 12,500 kilometers above the 2,377 kilometer wide dwarf planet's surface. The spacecraft also studied Pluto's binary partner Charon, as well as their four moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. Pluto is one of the largest known bodies in the Kuiper Belt, a ring of frozen worlds, comets and icy debris circling the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Ultima Thule is an ancient traditional name used to describe the most distant place known, a land well beyond the borders of the known world. In ancient Greek and Roman times, Ultima Thule was the place most furthest north, now thought to be a reference to either Iceland or Greenland although both the Orkney and Shetland Islands were also referred to as Ultima Thule during medieval times. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Blue Origin's New Shepard spacecraft has successfully undertaken its 10th test flight from its West Texas launch complex. Blue Origin's 18-metre-tall New Shepard suborbital spacecraft is a vertical takeoff and landing launch system comprising a liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled booster, known as the propulsion module, and a pressurised passenger or crew capsule designed to carry six people on ballistic trajectories to over 100 kilometres or 328,000 feet in altitude, the official start of space. The booster fires for approximately 110 seconds, accelerating the spacecraft to an altitude of about 40 kilometers or 130,000 feet, where MECO or main engine cutout and stage separation occur. The booster then returns to the surface for a powered vertical landing and servicing for the next launch. Meanwhile, the capsule's momentum continues carrying it upwards in unpowered flight, culminating at an apogee of just over 100 kilometers. Tourists are then treated to a few minutes of microgravity and some spectacular views of the Earth from space through giant panoramic picture view windows before the capsule begins descending back into the atmosphere. The descent is controlled by the deployment of parachutes, with solid rocket descent engines being fired just before touchdown to provide a soft landing. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Command engine start. 2, 1. on the rocket. Max Q confirmed she continues to punch her way to space. A beautiful burn on that BE-3 engine. Our next highlight is going to be main engine cutoff. But at this point, 
our new shepherd payloads. They're starting to feel those Gs are gonna come on gradually. We're gonna max at about three Gs on ascent. And then maybe counterintuitive to some, the max Gs that the payloads are gonna feel are about five just momentarily as the capsule comes in back into the atmosphere. All right, main engine cutoff is confirmed. While the speed is declining, the rocket and the, and the capsule are continuing its ascent to space. We're coming up shortly on separation. That is when the capsule is going to separate from the booster. There it is, separation is confirmed. At this point, if you were an astronaut on board, this is when you're gonna start to feel that weightlessness. We're gonna let you unbuckle. I know I'd be doing my somersaults in there before taking in those spectacular views out of the world's largest windows that have ever been to space. 300,000 feet, those payloads now are getting their nice clean micro Gs. We have crossed the 350,000 foot mark, which is what we were aiming for. Wow, almost right on the nose. 350,775 feet, thousand feet. That is absolutely incredible. That is exactly what we were targeting. All right, both craft are heading back home. The booster is gaining speed. The booster is actually gonna beat the capsule back to her landing pad, which is just two miles north of where it's taken off from. The capsule is about to hit atmospheric pierce point. That's when it comes back in through the atmosphere. At that point, it's gonna have some good air pressure to be able to push against for those control systems to, to work with. Now we've got the wedge fins that have deployed. So those are the fins at the top of the rocket that are housed in the ring fin. They keep the rocket stable. They work with the ring fin itself, which centralizes the air pressure that flows through the ring fin, keeps it nice and upright, just aerodynamically. Of course, it works in concert with the aft fins. This 10th mission of the New Shepard test program, everything looking nominal in flight so far. We hit an apogee of 350. 50,000 feet. Next year, we're looking for the drag brakes to deploy. There we go. Drag brakes deployed. That is cutting the speed. I can see New Shepard right over my shoulder. She is coming in. Boom! There we go. So that motor just came in nicely. And touchdown. Welcome home, New Shepard. Wow. Absolutely spectacular flight. That is the fourth mission to space and back for that rocket. That, everybody, is a reusable rocket. The show is not over. We're gonna wait for the crew capsule to come home. No crew in it today. We've got eight NASA payloads that have just had three to four minutes of some really clean micro Gs. But if you were an astronaut, can you imagine the views out of those windows after getting your own time to float in space? There go the drogues. Those are the guide parachutes. We're now waiting for the mains. A little bit of coning, that's all right. Those mains should take care of that. Reefing of the parachutes, now waiting for full inflation. There we go. Absolutely beautiful. A nice steady descent, 15, 16 miles an hour. We're about 1,500 feet above ground level. We, of course, are at 3,700 feet here at our West Texas launch site above mean sea level. Capsule coming back into our valley here in West Texas. Picture perfect flight so far. Wow, what a day. Last seconds, retro thrust system is gonna fire. Just in the last milliseconds, that is, it's gonna kick up the dust down here, but it provides a nice air cushion for all of those payloads on board today. And touchdown. Our recovery team has already started to head out towards both vehicles. They're gonna be going through all the, the safing operations, and we're gonna be getting those customers out to the capsule shortly here so they can go check out their payloads and start crunching all that wonderful data that they've gotten from their flight to space and back today. The flight lasting just 10 minutes and 15 seconds reached an altitude of around 107 kilometers. That's 350,775 feet, well above the 100 kilometer or 328,000 foot Kármán line, the official start of space. During the climb, New Shepard achieved a maximum ascent velocity of 3,600 kilometers per hour. The test flight, which is being seen as a prelude for the first manned test flights later this year, carried a number of experiments for NASA, including a propellant gauging experiment using sound waves to measure fuel levels in microgravity. There was a vibration isolation platform fitted as well. It's designed to separate payloads from the vibrations experienced during spaceflight. There was also an experiment to observe and collect data on the electromagnetic fields both outside and inside the New Shepard spacecraft during the launch. 
This was a test to work out ways of carrying out future global experiments on Earth's electromagnetic field. Another experiment looked at using safer and more environmentally friendly rocket propellants by better understanding the fuel's behaviour in microgravity. There was a micrometeoroid shield experiment, new technology to try and adapt orbital biology experiments for suborbital flights, new ways of cooling electronics aboard spacecraft, and equipment to measure the cabin pressure, temperature, CO2 levels, acoustic conditions and acceleration aboard the new Shepard capsule. Blue Origin plans to build at least 10 spacecraft flying at least once a week from their West Texas launch facility. SpaceX says it's planning the first test flight of its new Dragon 2 crew capsule, now known as Crew Dragon 2, for late February. The unmanned orbital certification test flight, known as Demo-1 or DM-1, will allow mission managers to check up both ground and spacecraft-based systems before the first crews ride the spaceship later this year. Preparations for the flight have continued despite the US government shutdown, which has affected 95% of NASA staff. The Falcon 9 launch vehicle, together with the Crew Dragon spacecraft, have already been rolled out for fit checks at Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida as part of pre-flight preparations for the mission. The spacecraft will test orbital approach and automated docking procedures with the International Space Station. Life support systems will also be monitored during the flight. It'll remain docked for a couple of weeks before conducting a full re-entry, splashdown and recovery sequence, providing data needed to achieve human spaceflight qualification for transporting crew to the space station. The same capsule will then be reused for a later in-flight abort test. This spacecraft is being developed very much as a successor to the current Dragon cargo ship upon which it's based. The new Dragon will be designed to remain docked to the space station for up to 210 days. One of the biggest additions to the new capsule will be the eight Super Draco hypergolic liquid fueled side mounted rocket engines. These are mounted in four twin pods, and they'll be used as the launch escape system as well as for orbital maneuvers. They were also originally designed for propulsive landings, although that's been put on the back burner for now in favour of the continued practice of parachute splashdowns at sea. Following February's test flight, a manned test flight, also to the International Space Station, is slated for around the middle of the year, with the spacecraft officially beginning crew transfer operations to the space station probably around December. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The Doomsday Clock, used by scientists to demonstrate how close humanity is to Armageddon, has now stalled at two minutes to midnight, meaning the world is as close to annihilation now as it was this time last year. Scientists warn that lack of progress has been caused by a failure to address nuclear threats, a lack of action on climate change, and a worsening cyber security and cyber warfare situation. It's only the third time the Doomsday Clock has been so close to global catastrophe. The first was in 1953 at the heart of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union and the United States were testing their thermonuclear weapons. The second was in January last year, following North Korea's nuclear tests and increasing concerns over the damage being caused by global warming. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which has maintained the doomsday clock since 1947, says cyber attacks aimed at sabotaging computer networks and the manipulation of social media by people practicing disinformation warfare have polarized populations, undermining trust in science. The group also noted that Russia, China and the United States have stopped talking to each other on arms issues such as nuclear nonproliferation. It says efforts to combat the effects of climate change have also worsened over the past year. Scientists have discovered a new type of blood vessel in the bone. A report in the journal Nature claims researchers found tiny blood vessels crisscrossing long bones connecting the surface to the interior. The capillaries help explain why doctors can inject drugs directly into a patient's leg bone to get them quickly to other parts of the body. The capillaries could also explain how immune cells made in bone marrow make their way out. An endangered Queensland bird, the southern black-throated finch, is now at risk of extinction because environmental legislation is failing to protect its habitat. The findings by the University of Queensland-led study examine both Australian and Queensland laws designed to protect threatened and endangered species. It's found the ineffective legislation has resulted in a reduction of over 80% in the distribution of the southern black-throated finch. A new study has found that forest soils need several decades to recover from bushfires and logging. That's much longer than previously thought. 
Scientists with the Australian National University found that forest soils took up to 80 years following a bushfire and at least 30 years after logging to recover from these events. Almost 99% of Victoria's mountain ash forests have either been logged or burnt over the past 80 years. So these forests are now facing a huge uphill battle to restore themselves to their former glory. Scientists reached their conclusions by collecting some 729 soil core samples from 81 sites exposed to different disturbance histories in the Victorian mountain ash forests. These forests generate nearly all of the water for the 5 million people living in Melbourne. They also store large amounts of biomass, carbon and support timber, pulpwood and tourism industries. You can read more about the findings in the journal Nature Geoscience. Scientists led by the British Antarctic Survey have for the first time successfully drilled over two kilometres down through the West Antarctic ice sheet using hot water. The new research will allow scientists to better understand how the region will respond to climate change. The team has been working on the Rutford ice stream for the last 12 weeks in freezing temperatures as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius, eventually breaking through to sediment some 2,152 metres below the surface. A string of instruments were then fed through the borehole to record water pressure, ice temperature and deformation within the ice around it. The research will help fill gaps in science's understanding of what's happening in West Antarctica and to better understand how the area is changing and contributing to sea level rise due to global warming. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.